Szanowni goście, nauczyciele i uczniowie, witam was serdecznie na pierwszym tegorocznym spotkaniu dotyczącym rozmów o karierze, a organizowanym przez Międzynarodową Szkołę Meridian we współpracy z uczelnią Vistula. Dear guests, teachers and students, I wish to kindly welcome everyone at this first career talk of this academic year, organized by Meridian International School in cooperation with Vistula University. Rozmowy o karierze to spotkania, które mają na celu zainspirować uczniów i pomóc im wybrać odpowiedni zawód. Są organizowane także po to, aby poszerzyć horyzonty młodzieży. Na spotkania zapraszani są goście, którzy prezentują swoje zawody oraz przedstawiają ich blaski i cienie. Mieliśmy już przyjemność gościć znanego polskiego dziennikarza, pana Jacka Żakowskiego, panią Annę Sochańską, przedstawicielkę dyplomacji, oraz popularnego prezentera i celebrytę Michała Figurskiego. Career talks are meetings which are designed to inspire students and help them choose the right profession. They are also organized in order to expand the horizons of young people. At the meeting, guests are invited who present their professions and depict their pros and cons. We have already had the pleasure to host the famous Polish journalist, Mr. Jacek Żakowski, a diplomat, Ms. Anna Sochańska, and popular radio personality Michał Figurski. Dziś przypadł mi zaszczyt zaprosić na scenę wybitnego polskiego reżysera, scenarzystę i wykładowcę Wydziału Radia i Telewizji imienia Krzysztofa Kieślowskiego Uniwersytetu Śląskiego, Kolegium Civitas w Warszawie oraz Wydziału Dziennikarstwa i Nauk Politycznych Uniwersytetu Warszawskiego, pana Krzysztofa Zanussiego. <laughs> Today I have the honor to welcome Professor Krzysztof Zanussi, outstanding Polish film director, screenwriter and lecturer at the Facility of Radio and Television at Salesian University, Collegium Civitas and Warsaw and the Department of Jerusalem and Political Science at the War University of Warsaw. Panie profesorze, zapraszamy na scenę. Dostałem mikrofon, ale teraz pytanie, czy mamy się porozumiewać po angielsku, czy mamy się porozumiewać po polsku. Na pewno po polsku jest mi łatwiej, ale sprostam zadaniu, każecie po angielsku. Będę się męczył, nie mam tak dobrego akcentu jak pan ale ja się w trudniejszych warunkach uczyłem tego języka. Mamy w naszym pokoleniu to usprawiedliwienie. So it's up to you. If you want to have it in English, it may be in English. If somebody must decide, it's not me to decide. So, Mr. I see. No, there is, a, there is a question of discrimination. If there is one single person who doesn't follow Polish, we have to do it in English. Because there is no one single person who doesn't follow English. Is there one? No, he wouldn't understand what I have asked. <laughs> no, nie ma człowieka, który nie zna tu angielskiego na sali, mam nadzieję. A jak jest, to niech się wstydzi, prawda? Bo co to znaczy? Proszę Państwa, nie ma żartu. W dzisiejszym świecie, w Waszym wieku, nie można być studentem i nie znać angielskiego. To jest po prostu jakby pomyłka po drodze. Tak jakbyście nie mieli, trzeba mieć prawo jazdy i umieć obsługiwać komputer. No to są trzy rzeczy, bez których nie można zacząć rozmowy. They're a little English, but they speak Polish. Little, little Polish, yes, that's why I think we have to comply with your request. English will be the first language, but if you need some translation, <laughs> you may have it. Anyway, well, I'm very happy to meet you. I'm very happy to be among young people. But when you ask me to talk about the career, I have to point out that language is it's a relevant question. European languages, Unlike English, we don't consider English European language because it is, it is British uh, invention and Britain is close to Europe, but Britons don't necessarily want to be considered part of Europe and as you know now, they don't insist to be part of European Union. So it is not my discrimination, it is just I don't want to touch any person from British Islands calling him European. It is optional. If you like to, you may consider yourself Europeans. 
but you know, English is a very difficult, different language from all the languages of Europe because it's a mixture of two different colliding roots. So it has many in linguistic intuitions which are very alien to Eu our other European languages. And one of these notions is career. In Polish, career has definitely a very negative uh, meaning. And we are making a slight distinction between, we say, Karierowicz, and this is definitely negative. It is a man or a person who tries to make a career, and we are supposed that we have other vocation not to make a career. Career is an instrument, but not a goal. And this is a very strong distinction. You don't have it in English. It doesn't sound clear what I say in English. I've tried it many times. I know it is not the way how Anglo-Saxon people put it. But we usually talk about fulfillment, about human desire to have full life rather than to make a career. And if you say, I do something in order to have my career accomplished, in English it's okay. In most European languages it doesn't sound good. So be careful about it because this little semantic difference makes hell of difference in life. And in my personal view, I was always very disappointed by certain features which are attributed to something what we call Slavonic soul. If you want to have an American, it will be Slavic soul, but I prefer good British Slavonic. You know, Slavonic in Polish is not a very positive notion. We rather consider it ironically. You know, when I work for the workers on Monday and then don't arrive to, for job, to do their job, because they, are, they were drunk and they have a heavy hangover, I say, oh, it is excuse, Slavonic soul. Słowiańska dusza. Zapiu i nie przyszedł. So we are not very proud in Poland of our Slavonic roots, and we know very well that the notion is from 19th century. We don't really know exactly what does it mean, who is Slavonic and who is not. Me, myself, I'm not, because you hear my name. My name is Italian. So I am from the mother's side, I have Slavonic roots, but from the father's side, I, I have not. It doesn't matter really. It is all façon de parler. That is the way of speaking, nothing more than that. But in, I started making this notion about Poland being a country that has a language that has Slavonic roots. But this means very little because you know Bulgaria is a country where they speak a Slavonic language, very ancient one, but ethnically many of them are not Slavonic, many of them are Turkish in fact. And this is totally different. In opposite, Romania ethnically has many people of, with Slavonic roots, many people say it is the vast majority, but they have Romanic language. Does it matter? It does not matter, in fact. But language is definitely forming. I don't think ethnic roots are so evident in scientifically it has never been proven and old study was a little bit undermined or even um, we're embarrassed about talking about it because of the Hitlerian racism. So race is something very difficult to define and I think we, none of us knows what does mean. So let us drop our Slavonic or not Slavonic background. It is a question of mentality, which is different in various social uh, circles. And back to the career. Accomplishment. A desire to achieve something in life. But what it is what we want to achieve? professional satisfaction or just money, and power and position. If we think only about money and power, which are somehow interconnected, 
who has money has power, who has power has money. So this is an instrument to me, but I will never call it a goal. It is not a reason why I make an effort all my life long. And so why do I make my effort? As an artist, as a filmmaker, as a figure that has privilege of speaking in public, appearing in public, writing for a public, I try to share with other people my feelings, my experience, my fears, my pain, my joy. Sharing and communicating is a goal. But in order to communicate, I must make a career. Because in my profession, if I want to make a film, I must have enormous amount of money behind me. Somebody must give me money, and this is a question of career. And I must use it and be free using it. Many people want to make films. Very few people do. So you need to make a career. If you are a poet, you don't have this problem. Because as a poet, you may write your beautiful verses at home on the little piece of paper, and you're independent, you're free. Still, you have to c communicate your poetry to send it to somebody. Then money is involved. If you want to print, to have it printed. But today, with in internet, you may also distribute your poetry without money, practically, but not films. Of course, you may say that you could shoot films having uh, just um, not only camera, but just simply a telephone, mobile telephone, and there are some films shot. But, and again, you need enormous money to get to the audience because we need the whole system of distribution. This is changing our days and is getting more democratic, but also more confused. Anyway, in order to make a film, it is easy to say, first you have to make a career because you must gain somebody's trust. And if you have this trust, money is with you, you can express yourself and your expression will be accepted or not accepted or rejected. This is another, qu another question. So more or less, this is the way how I define my position. Career is an, a grade. It is one of the steps towards my goal. My, my goal is bigger than the career. And then, of course, I'm happy I never got an Oscar, and I'm afraid I will never get one. But for my generation, Oscar was not so important, because this is purely American. American uh, Oscar is only for American films, and the non-English non language film, it is a charity Oscar, nobody cares about it in America. We Europeans care, but that's our snobbery. And otherwise, I'm not in this system, so this is not my real goal. Of course, I'm happy if I get prizes on some festivals like Cannes, like Venice, Berlin, Moscow, there are big festivals. I'm happy if I get good reviews, but I have one real goal, it is to leave this goal is to leave a trace so that people get something from me. If they forget to borrow what they have seen of my films, let us say, on television, from the box office point of view, I may be happy. But from my personal point of view, I am very unhappy. And this is one of the problems. I must leave a trace. I want people to owe me something. I want people to say, because I've seen your film, I, I got acquainted with some figure, some character, some situation, some mood, and then I'm happy. I say, I delivered you something. So that's the way how I put career. But in order to make this career in my profession, you have to overcome some basic contradictions. Because you must be a dreamer and you must be a doer. And this doesn't coincide naturally. I will quote you in Polish my 
great colleague and great master who is 14 years senior to me, so I may wa watch him now as a colleague, but he was always my great competitor, he was always winning, Andrzej Wajda, definitely the greatest Polish filmmaker ever. Andrzej Wajda wymyślił takie powiedzonko, że reżyser musi być jednocześnie kapralem i poetą. No jeżeli widzieliście kaprali, to wśród nich nigdy nie ma poetów. A jeśli znacie poetów, to nikt z nich nie marzy, żeby być kapralem. To są najbardziej przeciwstawne yy, powołania, a reżyser musi je skupić w jednym ręku. Musi być człowiekiem czynu i musi być marzycielem. No jak wiecie, marzyciele na ogół nie są praktyczni, a ludzie praktyczni to nie są marzyciele. Więc ta sprzeczność ciąży nad naszym zawodem i dlatego to jest jeden z naj, najbardziej takich nienaturalnych zawodów. When I say that this profession is not natural, I will add something more. In our daily work, we have very, we, we are expected to have a particular, particular um, element of our craft is to be all the time totally distracted and perfectly concentrated. It is absolutely not natural. But that's the way we have to work and we have to learn about it. It's aphysiological. Our mind is not built for that purpose. But still, I may talk to you, but I must be aware what is happening around, if there is any disturbing noise, because if I'm shooting, I must know all the dangers, and dangers are endless. Because one car is incorrectly parked, and in a moment it will be a problem. Because there is a bad weather approaching, and I must finish before this cloud will bring the rain, and so on and so on. I must feel that the conflict is boiling between two actors, and at the same time, I have to talk to the third actor about something else, and so on and so on. So this profession is very rare. You know, we have a couple of hundreds of film directors or directors in a whole country of almost, four, almost 40 millions. So it is a very, very unusual profession. Maybe also because it is so unnatural. Also because the demand is very small. There is no such a great need that there must be hundreds of directors. Other people make films and they are not professionals. They are just make it for fun, for entertainment. And this is what we have to combine. We have to do it having joy of work and at the same time sell the product. And that's another question, which especially for young people. I address this question to artists, but it, it, it applies to all of you. You have to sell yourself well, but at the same time, I would suggest save your soul. Soul is not for sale. But your profession is for sale. You have to be sold to a company, to, 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 to the uh, enterprise, to your uh, employer. You have to sell your craft, your qualities, but you must defend your dignity. And dignity is part of your, part of your soul. And this is not for sale. Very difficult distinction. And one of the things that frightens me when I see not that much your, gener young genera your generation, a little bit older generation, people who are 10 years senior to you, when I've seen 10 years ago when they were entering the market, the amount of op opportunism, amount of the, the, the way how people were acting with no dignity was sometimes embarrassing. And the most common example is when I see a big corporation, I see young employee, and I see the boss who is telling a very heavy joke, not funny at all. And all these opportunists laugh because they know their promotion depends if they laugh in the right moment, then the boss is happy. And they behave like idiots. I'm embarrassed. My laughter is not for sale. Of course, sometimes I smile out of courtesy, 
very often when I don't understand the joke in a foreign language, in order to avoid translation, I just smile because I don't expect this joke to be very good. But of course, I want nobody to notice because when they st start to explain to me what is funny, it becomes not funny at all sometimes. But so I'm not so rigid about it, but I just brought up one of the examples. Please don't sell your dignity even when you laugh and you are not feeling like laughing. This is already a first step towards something what we, with some exaggeration, call prostitution. People prostitute not only in the very sense of the word, but they prostitute when they play up to the others in a way that hurts their dignity. This we must not do. And here I am well convinced that this must not be tolerated. If we start doing it, we lose. But from another hand, if you are very rigid, when you are terribly principled, you may also lose your chance and become a very unpleasant person. So the base of your attitude is your, your, your measure, how much love you have to the others. First of all, how much, you have, how much love and respect you have to yourself. If you don't like yourself, that's already a problem. I don't believe that you will be able to, to love other people if you don't like yourself. So you have to get into peace with yourself, admit your weakness, admit your imperfection. No, nobody is perfect. But admitting we are not perfect doesn't mean that we accept that we are not perfect. No, we make an effort to improve, to be better, and we are still not perfect, up to the end. This is my, is it a recipe? I don't know. It is my belief that this is the way how we should resolve our problems. Being realistic from one hand, idealistic from another hand. Being a little bit a dreamer and being a doer. If you can combine this all, then you understand career is not a goal. You don't leave to make a career. You make a career to leave. To live a full life with all aspects without sacrificing your private life to your professional life and not sacrificing your professional life for your private life. Looking for a balance. This is what ancient Greece has taught us and it's a great teaching. We are losing it now because we are losing touch with the antiquity and this is the basis of European mentality. It is a Greek philosophy. And moderation is the word. Moderator, moderation. That means some sort of balance between various extre extreme extremities. Well, easy to say, very difficult to do. Because people who are <clears throat> very strongly motivated, who have a passion, they very easily become one-sided. And this is the danger. But it's also a chance to achieve something if you concentrate on one thing only. Do it temporarily. Sometimes it helps. Maybe for a couple of years you sacrifice your private life for your profession. But don't do it as a life program. Opposite way around as well. Many women who bear children, they have to sacrifice their professional career and let them do it but not to bury this career forever. Just interrupt it and catch up when the situation in family will allow you to. This is moderation. It is the way how to combine conflicting elements together and find your way. Well, I'm wondering how long should I continue my monologue? Because I hope you will continue with some questions, with some ideas. It, otherwise, I may be totally out of touch. I have no slightest idea what are your professions. I know some of you are politologists, sociologists, but it is a very approximate information I got from Mr. Chancellor just entering. So maybe I am talking about something wrong. I've heard that you expect career as a subject matter. So I try to elaborate on career. And now I'm open to your questions, to your remarks to the polemics, if you want to 
in polemic, to go into polemics, and I think we have to, we may liberally allow both languages. Is it okay if somebody is unwilling to ask question in English, ask it in Polish? We are, for most of us, except native English speakers, English is a is a foreign language. We have acquired it with big difficulty, and we feel free to use it as a vehicle, but we are not. We, there is no obligation for us to be perfect. We are not. We don't need to be perfectionists. So let us admit our flaws also in a language. So please think about what would you like to ask me, or when would you like to contradict me? Please go. Because you know I am teaching at Collegium Civitas, and I have this course already have been having it for many years. And I have a method that when my semester is over and I have to make an exam, examination at the end, I don't want my students to present me my own ideas because it is an author's lesson. So I say, you have to bring me three points where you strongly disagree with me, then you will have the best note. If you disagree only in two points, you have a little less good note. If there is one disagreement, there is a mediocre note. If there is no disagreement, you lost your semester. <laughs> you don't need to, <laughs> to have the same ideas as I have. And of course, I try to, when they tell me why they disagree, sometimes there's a misunderstanding, which is always a signal of my fault. If somebody understands me incorrectly, it means I presented my ideas in an incorrect way. So next year I will improve. Now I have less basic conflicts. At the beginning there were many ideas that people were taking wrong because I was articulating it incorrectly. Otherwise, if we talk about ideas, I want to hear opposite ideas and I try to provoke people saying many things which are unfashionable. Like for example, I preach, and young people don't like it, that spontaneity is a tremendous vice. Please don't be spontaneous. It is terrible lack of culture. Culture is taming spontaneity. And then I have to elaborate, I don't want to provoke you saying only that. If you are spontaneous, it means you don't care about the others. And this is not nice. And often in common speech you try to make a counterposition, spontaneous and hypocritical. This is not the counterposition. It is spontaneous and controlled. So I want me, myself, to be controlled. And if I give an example, if I am in the tramway, in the streetcar, going from the cemetery, and I see many people crying after a funeral, and I'm in a very good mood, and I would like to sing and laugh. If I'm spontaneous, I go ahead. But I'm a pig, because I neglect other people's feeling. When somebody shouts loud, but think about other people who don't feel comfortable when you shout loud because you have such a mood, don't be spontaneous. So this is one of the points of the provocation. There is less of a provocation when I preach something what people who have strong family culture will know as a banality. Keep away from anything what is fashionable. Fashion is a bad taste. Fashion is typical for lower class. Don't do it. Nie bądźcie modni, to jest nic gorszego. Ktoś modny to już jest tan, to jest tandeta, to jest tani. I to ludzie, którzy mają korzenie rodzinne, to to wiedzą z dzieciństwa. Nie wypada być modnym. Nie wypada się modnie ubierać, nie wypada się modnie malować, nie wypada mówić modnych poglądów. To jest po prostu marne. Jak ktoś jest nikim, no to stara się być modny. Z modem można coś wybrać. Ale przecież ile razy, no ja jestem reżyserem, rozumiecie, patrzę na dziewczynę, widzę jaka jest moda i ona się ubiera wedle mody kompletnie przeciwko swojej urodzie. No ma krzywe nogi, moda każe mieć krótkie spódniczki. No to ktoś może mieć długą spódniczkę, jeżeli masz niedobre nogi, nie pokazuj jej nawet jak połowa koleżanek chodzi w mini, bo to jest głupota po prostu. Jak masz długą, pociągłą twarz, a modne są grzywki, 
No to noś grzywkę, bo to ci przystoi, ale jak masz buzię jak rondelek, to grzywki nie noś, bo ci będzie to źle wyglądać, te wszystkie koleżanki noszą grzywkę. No to jest właśnie hasło, nie bądź modny na miłość boską, tylko bądź, bądź prawdziwy, rób najlepsze możliwy użytek ze swojej urody, ale to samo ze swoich poglądów, ze swoich myśli. No nie mówcie mi modnych banałów, prawda? nie plećcie mi głupot o tolerancji. Ja tego słuchać nie mogę, bo to jest wszystko puste i głupie. Trzeba się zastanowić, co naprawdę mówicie, o jaką to, o jaką to cnotę chodzi. I wtedy mam wrażenie, że mam do czynienia z żywym człowiekiem, a nie z papugą, która powtarza to, co widziałam. To miała być zachęta do Państwa, chodźcie się pokłócić o coś, albo przynajmniej o coś zapytać, bo inaczej będzie nudno. Więc słuchajcie, kończę już swoje monologowanie i teraz w Waszych rękach dalsza część rozmowy. Kto chce o coś zapytać, to coś, panowie tutaj moderatorzy, prawda, to próbujcie zrobić to niekonwencjonalnie, tylko tak żywo. Serdecznie dziękujemy za tą przemowę, panie profesorze. We would like, very like to thank you for, for your wonderful speech. A teraz macie... Teraz macie wspaniałą okazję zadać pytania naszemu gościowi. And now you have a wonderful opportunity uh, to ask questions. To jest teraz kto odważny, kto pierwszy się o coś zapyta. Ja już tak wstałem, żeby mnie było lepiej widać, bo trudno... O, tutaj jakaś ręka drgnęła. O, słucham pana. Jaki, w jakim języku to się po polsku, czy pan... Jak panu łatwiej, jak można po angielsku, to jesteśmy uprzejmi wobec tych... Moral anxiety, yes. Yes. It is still on because it uh, kind of uh, seems over ambitious as a title, but it created many, many interesting films. Uh, but it's not strongly you know, limited only to Poland because there was something like that in, in the United States and then so on. But uh, do you find that it's uh, in McDonaldization, in the time of McDonaldization, that there is something in place for the moral anxiety film? <laughs> I see. McDonaldization is a totally different phenomenon, very universal, and we may talk about it very much in details. But moral anxiety or moral questions were always in the core of narrative art. Greek tragedy is all about moral issues, and over the moral issues we have existential issues, destiny and human fate. But first, Antigone has to bury her brother, and this is a moral issue, and Creon is against it, because it's against the law. So consciousness and law in collision, it is a moral issue. And in Poland, this period, when we were making films that were called, in such a nice way, film of moral anxiety, It was a moment when communist, communist ideology was totally in discrepancy with the reality. The amount of corruption, of cynicism in everyday life was enormous and the ideology was talking about ideal society. And we were pointing out in our films this discrepancy. And this was a temporary moment But there are always ethical conflicts, and they are most interesting for art. So I think there is a room, but when you talk about magnalization, you talk about mass culture. The mass culture is a new phenomenon for us. It arrived recently as a big, big fact. In communist time, popular culture, so-called popular, that means low culture, was of no major importance, nobody cared about it too much. Now, because of the economical factors, this popular culture, that means low culture, became very powerful. But it doesn't mean that it is really so important, because majority is always wrong. So what majority is choosing is, well, I cannot say is irrelevant, but don't be fascinated by majority, because majority is always wrong. You know, majority did not believe Copernicus, Who cares? Copernicus was right, majority was wrong. 
Today, majority has no idea what Einstein thinks about time and space. And majority is wrong. Who cares? And that's you know provocative way of putting it, because we live in democracy. But democracy is only a way of avoiding conflicts and ruling society without violence, without extreme violence. But it's not the best of all systems. Maybe we will invent something better than democracy today, and maybe new kind of democracy. And there is no democracy in the major fields of our life. There is no democracy in science. There is no democracy in sport, because there are, there are uh, winners, so it's not undemocratic, we are not equal, and there is no democracy in arts. So majority has bad taste. This is a fact of life, this is a fact of mathematics, of statistics. Majority is mediocre. So today, when you ask about McDonaldization, majority is eating McDonald's food. I don't, because I worked at McDonald's many years ago. I'm not supposed to tell you my experience because I signed in London that this is a secret, but I don't, you won't find me uh, dead in McDonald's place. Please, question, and then you. To jest kwestia godności po prostu, szczególnie, że się łamie najczęściej szacunek do prywatności własnej. To jest ekshibicjonizm, to jest kategoria psychiatryczna, bardzo przykra. No jak ktoś koniecznie się chce rozbierać do naga, no, a nie jest piękny, no bo jakby był piękny, to zwykle bierze za to pieniądze. A jak nie jest, to wtedy się bardzo lubi rozbierać. A my uciekamy wzrokiem za kłopotaniem, bo po co mamy oglądać szkaradę, prawda? prawda? Ubrana szkarada jest ładniejsza od gołej. Więc proszę pani, ja myślę, że to jest wszystko w kręgu po prostu własnej kultury. Tego, na co kultura tego danego człowieka pozwala, a gdzie kultura zapala czerwone światełko i mówi, nie, ja takich rzeczy nie robię. Ja się nie upubliczniam z takimi rzeczami. To nie ma nic wspólnego z zakłamaniem czy z hipokryzją. To jest tylko coś ma wspólnego z godnością. Ja nie powinienem się wstydzić niczego, czemu nie jestem sam winien, ale ja muszę być świadom swoich słabości. Jak dzisiaj na przykład ludzie bez przerwy chcą szukać swojej ekspresji, to ja przypominam stare dobre przysłowie, jeśli nie potrafisz, nie pchaj się na afisz. Po co pa się pchasz ze swoją ekspresją, skoro ona jest szkaradna? Albo wykształć swój gust i swoją, swoje rzemiosło i wtedy ta ekspresja stanie się może piękna. A jak nie masz talentu, to szukaj ekspresji na innym polu. Nie musisz koniecznie smarować po moim płocie, dlatego że ci się chce tym sprejem smarować, bo smarujesz szkaradnie. No po prostu to, co namalowałeś jest brzydkie, ja to muszę zamalować, bo mi to sprawia przykrość. Interesowałem się tym malarstwem graficiarskim. Ono ma tam swoje konwencje, no ale generalnie proszę nie na moim płocie, bo bardzo rzadko się zdarza, że to było ładne. Więc chyba tyle mogłem odpowiedzieć. Proszę pana. Well, oh, you are for, but then you, yes, please. Go ahead. Yes, you are done. Well, I just very much for the, the talk. It was interesting. I don't know how everybody else thought today, but I was most impressed by hearing somebody who does not put out the usual politically correct cliches that I'm hearing. 23 hours of the day and 24 hours. Um, but I would just like to point on one thing here. You said that I would get three, mark, three, three extra points if I was able to correct you three times or something. Um, I, I see a little element of, of contradiction in terms of when you said about acting spontaneously, that we have to act in a controlled way, which up to a point is a little bit of the basis of political correctness, I think, of always being controlled, of never wanting to offend. But at the same time, you say that we should um, no, when you get, when we precise both sides, I think there is not, at least I don't see the contradiction that's that strong. And when I say about spontaneity, 
and about tolerance, which I very like, very often like to say tolerance is not a great issue. It is not a great issue because tolerance has been extracted from the general ideal of high culture. If you have high culture, you don't talk about tolerance. You are tolerant. It is part of your mind. In other words, if I want to, let me give you an example which is a little bit kinological because I have nine dogs. My all nine dogs, most of them are Labradors. Lab Labrador, uh, this very strange dog that is genetically apt to catch birds. And I live in the village, so whenever my dogs are out, they were bringing me a hen from the neighbor. And I had to pay to apologize and to eat broth, which I don't like. So finally, with a can, I forced my dogs to be tolerant. They don't eat chicken anymore, but they don't love them. Because you cannot, using a can, you can achieve tolerance, but you cannot achieve love. Now, if I have a Pakistani neighbor, and I am, after dressage, I am taught not to make ugly faces when I smell this terrible kitchen that he is, smell from his kitchen, it is okay. But if I am a cultivated man, I have simply, I am open to different scents, and what, what, his, what is in his kitchen doesn't make me suffer. So I don't need to be tolerant. I have no, in, I have no uh, reason to make ugly faces. And so on, so on. So here is the, the element of contradiction. And I try to overcome it. But I admit that many of my ideas collide with some other of my ideas. And this is, I think, a natural situation of a human being. If I, want, if I try to resolve one contradiction, I immediately create another one. That's also my, my limitation. Please, you were willing yes. to say something. Um, going back to the perils of energy, which you seem to mention, uh, don't you think that in artistic terms, it's more? I mean, that's not for you, but for the actors. I think we say very often when we talk about the craftsmanship of an actor that it has to be controlled and conscious spontaneity. Take Stanislavski. He is talking a lot how to achieve spontaneity after a long process of self control and analyze. When you are totally spontaneous, you usually, as an actor, are unable to fix something. So in theater it is impossible, in film you, well, you make one take and the second one is already bad and you don't know why you did it well. So you have to imitate spontaneity, you have to pretend you are spontaneous, but you have to do it consciously. There is a one saying about great British actor, Laurence Olivier, who once played, I think it was, if I remember correctly, it was Otello, one of these very difficult parts. And he was very unhappy with Otello, like most actors are. And one day, on one of the performances, he was incredibly good. And after the performance, he went down to his dressing room, and he was furious. So his assistant asked, Master, you were so good today. Why you are you not happy? And Lorenzo Olivier said, I know I was very good, but I don't know why, and that's why I'm not happy. So this is about spontaneity <laughs> in actors. Please go. Anyway, um, it may be that we have some body magazine here. As a director, you have a lot of things that are the director. As a director, what could a body actor do to impress you, to make you impress you? Well, I wonder if I want to be impressed of, or if I want to be moved or if I want to be pleased because I want to like what actor is doing in front of me and I have to encourage my actor 
to feel comfortable and to have a desire to please me, then we have the same vibrations, we have the same frequencies. But I expect both strong expression and, and something what is contained and what is controlled. So <laughs> this is a contradiction again. <laughs> yes, please. Proszę bardzo. Jak głośno powtórzę, pani pyta po filmie moim cwał, czy ja miałem do czynienia z końmi. Zaraz chętnie o tym coś opowiem. Bo do koni mam bardzo wielki sentyment do dzisiaj. I to dwie panie wspólnie to, to samo pytanie, tak? No ja rozumiem, z koń, o koniach można wspólnie. Proszę Państwa, ja się wychowałem przy koniach, to prawda, w tych zwariowanych stalinowskich czasach i muszę powiedzieć, że wiele rzeczy, co wiem o ludziach, to wiem dzięki koniom, bo jakoś na koniach wiele rzeczy widać, a potem w końcu jesteśmy wszyscy przyrodą ożywioną. Więc różne uczucia, które konie żywią, różne sposoby na życie, które koń wybiera, są zupełnie podobne jak, jak u ludzi. U koni też wybucha histeria czasami. Konie kłamią, udają. Konie świetnie wiedzą, kiedy ja kłamię albo kiedy ja się boję i wtedy biorą, biorą nade mną przewagę. Więc to wszystko najpierw się nauczyłem na koniach, a potem zobaczyłem, że u ludzi jest tak samo. Tak mi się złożyło w moim życiu. Do tej pory jeszcze troszkę jeżdżę konno, już jako starszy pan, ostrożnie i ciężkawo, ale strasznie to lubię i strasznie się cieszę, jak siedzę na koniu i mogę się dookoła rozglądać. Proszę bardzo. Well, it is, it is a question I was confronted with many times, so I have something like a standard answer. My scientific background will steer me to such an answer. I would have needed a twin brother who did not study physics and became a filmmaker to observe the difference between two of us. That would be the only scientific way to prove because physics formed me at a time when I was very young and very open. And maybe it made a damage or maybe it opened me up, I don't know. But this me who is today in front of you was formed by my studies in physics. And of course I'm grateful they were not destructive to me. They, I don't think they blocked me, but maybe they steered me in one direction and I, would have, I could have developed in different direction. I think I was always in love with physics and to tell the truth, I'm still in love with physics, but I try to say it in a funny way. I discovered that physics is not in love with me, and that's a hell of a difference. <laughs> so if physics is not in love with me, I thought four years is enough. I won't change it. But I have great respect to the clarity of scientific thinking. I love mathematics as well, and I think there is a room for somebody like myself in art, but I wouldn't suggest any other artist to start with physics. For one, it may be beneficiary, and to many others, it may be absolutely destructive. Who knows? <laughs> yes, please. Yes, well, the other lady started first, and the, you second. All right. Kto dalej ten ma pierwszeństwo? To tak zawsze. Don't bother. 
I was living the same way, but I was definitely, desperately seeking what is my real vocation, where I feel comfortable, but when I get a feedback, I knew that my self, that my own feelings is not a criterion. I must feel that other people confirm that what I do is in some, some way good. It is not enough that I believe it is good. And when I, I made many things, I made amateur theater as a student. I was writing for some papers. Uh, all this I was doing well enough, but only with my short films that I shot as a student, I realized that I am probably better than average. And I was getting these prizes that were very important for me because the competition was anonymous, nobody knew. And in one national competition for amateur filmmakers, out of 10 prizes, I got seven. So then I thought, well, it cannot be a pure sheer coincidence. Maybe this is my vocation, not theater, not writing, but filmmaking. It was very important for me to have this confirmation coming from the others. It was after many years of, already many years of studies, because I studied physics and then philosophy, and I still felt it is not what I want, and this is not where I will be good. And it's important to be good in what you do. Well, here my answer, I, if I guess what your intention of your question is, my answer may be a little bit disappointing because I have a certain privilege which is based on my misery, historical misery. You know, I have a feeling, no, I am, I am a child of the war and I don't take my life for granted. I've seen so many other people killed around. So when somebody feels a survival, and I survived, I thought it is exceptional. It is not normal to be alive. It is, I'm already a winner. We survived the war, me, my mom, and my dad, whom I lost for some time, and it's also a very particular experience, that for a time being, half a year, I knew I am an orphan. I have no father. There were some reports that my father is dead. And suddenly, we, fo we found our father in 45. He was far away, and there was no communication. So this was a very strong motivation that if I am alive, I must make good use of life. I don't take life as, uh, for granted that this is given to everybody, and I, I don't expect I have many rights. I think I have more obligations. And so my childhood, bad childhood, disciplined me very strongly. And beyond this discipline, not to sound too idealistic, is simply fear, enormous fear of failure, of being good for nothing, of being an embarrassment to my ancestors, to my parents. And this was a strong motivation. I must prove them that I'm okay. Now even an old man, I want to prove my wife that I'm good for something and I'm always up un unhappy when I have a meeting like this and she's not here. Because I would like to prove, look, they listen to me. You don't listen sometimes and they listen. <laughs> so, this is the answer. Well, they were always high-budget Hollywood films as long as I remember, because also before World War II they were making some 
big films like Gone with the Wind. You know, big budget is one of the elements when you make a spectacular film, you need big budget. And sometimes big budget film may be a good film. As a rule, the statistics is that among big budget films, there are as many flops as among low budget films. I'm very attached to the statistics. And that's why I, have, I dare to say that majority is always wrong, because that's the curve of Gauss, if you remember from mathematics. Majority is always mediocre in everything. Sport, beauty, intelligence, integrity. Majority is mediocre. There are some who are even worse than average. Then there are some who are excellent. So I always care about excellence. What does mean that I am excellent, but I try at least, I, I strive in this direction. And that's how you reply it to your question, that majority is wrong or is, I, you know, this is a reaction to consumeristic society today, which is using very often slogans which to me are appalling. When they say, this product sells best, I avoid this product. Because it sells best, it means it cannot be good. Because majority doesn't know what to buy. Only very shrewd, clever people, small majority, knows what is good. It is a little bit demagogical, but to some extent it is true. When I hear that the book is a bestseller, I remember, and here probably you will protest, all of you, because that's not your generation language. My father was telling me, look, this is a bestseller. Throw it to the garbage immediately. Everybody reads this book. You cannot take it to, it's a waste of time. Or give it to your driver or to the cleaning woman. She will be on the level of average. But don't read bestsellers. What is right? However, there is an evolution because the amount of people who are reading books, still it is a minority, but it's much larger today than in the past. And it is true that majority is reading rubbish. This is true. And masterpieces are for very few. By masterpiece, I mean literature or works of art who touch deeply the basic problems of my existence. So here is the point where I, why I dare to say something so ugly that majority is always wrong. Still, I respect the rules of democracy. Please. Uh, may I give the second line to your testimony? Uh, this is a quotation used by language. Folks eat shit, millions of flies can go wrong. <laughs> so, uh, this is something yeah, that reflects <laughs> your opinion. Uh, uh, how many, how many uh, number one bestsellers can be in the state? That's a bestseller of the 2013. How many number ones can be? Could you tell us something? How you uh, employed, uh, how you brought in uh, Mr. Michael to your film, Persona Don't Don't Drive? Well, I knew him, and I've known him for many years, and I spoke to him about this project. I knew he would be happy to play a person of power, because that's what in life he likes very much. So when I wrote it, he was convinced, and he says, okay, I will play for it. He is a great star. He was a co-producer, so I cannot, I have no even idea what his uh, salary was what his honorary was, what his fee was, it was probably enormous, but he paid his own, from his own company, and he was quite happy with the film. How did you meet first? Many years ago, how did you meet first? Oh, many, many years ago, together with his brother Konchalovsky, we were somehow belonging to the same generation. Uh, Mikita is a couple of years uh, junior, uh, Konchalovsky is a year older than me. These two brothers were the most eminent with Tarkovsky, Repre uh, representatives of the same generation of filmmakers in Russia. So I met them when I made my second feature film, Family Life. I traveled to Russia and I had the first meetings and they were, ex they were interested in my work. I was interested in their work. So this is an old, well-established friendship. Or acquaintance, I cannot say great friendship because I don't share most of the ideas and I wouldn't endorse most of the choices that Bihalkov has done. But still, we know each other. Yes, please. Uh, 
na Pani Konstytucji jako Rynkera miał pewien sukces. Chciałabym coś o nim Proszę bardzo, proszę Pani, gdybym miał się dzisiaj tak rozliczać, do kogo z wielkich filozofów mam słabość, to pewnie do świętego Augustyna. Augustyn z Hipony. Dla tych, co nie uważają, że jest święty, bo to jest inna kategoria, jako filozof jest Augustynem z Hipony. I owszem, bardzo go lubiłem. Wydaje mi się, że jest on jednym z ojców Europy. W tym sensie, że cały psychologizm od niego się zaczął. Spojrzenie w samego siebie. Literatura innych kultur zawsze opisywała świat zewnętrzny. A on pierwszy w tym konfesjones spojrzał sam w siebie. I zawsze pociąga mnie ten nurt egzystencjalny w filozofii. Lubiłem ją, aczkolwiek to nie jest ta filozofia. Ona była przez moment modna, jak egzystencjaliści przyszli do głosu, ale to był Pascal, którego zawsze bardzo lubiłem. Do niego też do dziś dnia wracam. A nie była to na przykład filozofia analityczna, do której powinno mi być bliżej ze względu na matematykę i fizykę, ale dlatego, że ja nie miałem potrzeb, żeby filozofia była precyzyjna, to mnie to raczej nudziło. Po co budować taki precyzyjny budynek na takim słabym fundamencie? Zawsze można podważyć sam fundament. Także do tego nie miałem zupełnie słabości, mimo że mój profesor, fenomenolog, także pan Ingarden, uczeń Husserla, był fantastycznym wykładowcą, cudownym człowiekiem, ale jego filozofia zupełnie mnie nie pociągała. Proszę bardzo, tutaj. Przepraszam bardzo, panie profesorze, niestety czas już nam się kończy. Czas się kończy, to już niestety, jest wasza, <głos> wasza dyscyplina. Niestety Dobrze. czas spotkania nam się już kończy. Bardzo, bardzo serdecznie dziękujemy za to wspaniałe spotkanie. Dziękujemy, że zechciał pan przyjść tutaj i podzielić się z nami tymi wszystkimi informacjami. Jesteśmy zaszczyceni gościć pana tutaj. Dziękuję bardzo.